Okay, so we're back for the final part of this lecture. I'm going to talk to you about some of the key sociological thinkers that are relevant to environmental sociology. You'll recognise some of these people from, um, from previous lectures and then some might be a bit less familiar to you. So the first one is a hopefully by now familiar face, Manuel Castells, who works across a range of areas. You'll remember him from his work on the kind of network society, um, Castells is also interested in social movements, and that's kind of the hook of his, um, his relevance to environmental sociology. He regards environmentalism as a social identity um, and views it as a reaction to the kind of dominant tendency of our current, what he would call a network society, to overuse and overextend the capacity of natural resources. And so Castells views environmentalism as a social movement, um, and he's very interested in social movements, how they develop. However, Castells is also a realist when it comes to the environment, so he's interested in the kind of material realities of environmental issues and views that as their, um, their, their kind of real state. And... Um, so Castells defines environmentalism as a multi-pronged movement made up of activists, scientists, and celebrities acting on the media and networking via the internet. They've transformed the way we think about nature and about our place on the planet. So again, Castells is interesting for thinking through the, the role of environmentalism as both a social identity and as part of a social movement. So I think his work is interesting for thinking through essentially um, how, how activism and social movements can, can change the social perception or the perceived social importance of certain environmental issues. And so he's interested for looking at the role of social movements in the movement towards environmental change. Again, this would be something like the Friday for Future, um, like school strike, climate protests, um, Especially, I think they're a good example because um, during the, the pandemic, they've gone virtual and uh, people have been protesting from their bedrooms with their signs and such. So very much a, a networked social movement. There's also Anthony Giddens, who I've been um, drawing from throughout this lecture so far, who's um, written, I've been drawing from his 20, sorry, yes, 2009 um book The Politics of Climate Change. Uh, so Giddens is very much a, a reformist. He's interested in making kind of incremental changes to the current system and ways of doing things. So you'll remember the, um, the reformist approach is things like carbon capture technology, electric cars, ways of using technology to to kind of make changes to our existing way of doing things that make it more, more environmentally sustainable. And so um, Giddens points out something quite interesting, which is, um, is called the Giddens paradox. Uh, he states that since the, since the dangers posed by global warming aren't tangible, immediate or visible, many will sit on their hands and do nothing of a concrete nature about them. Yet waiting until they become visible and acute before before being stirred to serious action will by definition be too late. So the paradox here is really the fact that we will not be spurred into action until we are able to personally witness the impact of climate change, but by the time that comes about, it'll be too late to actually do anything to prevent it from continuing to unfold. And so Giddens is concerned about the, the politics of climate change because you know, he's, he's concerned about um, why we are not more worried um, and why climate change has not kind of elicited the type of political response that, um, that one might expect such a, an existential threat to our species survival to, um, to elicit. Uh, next, we have Inglehart, who... Um, who said who proposed the post-materialism thesis so Inglehart proposed that there is a generational shift in values with older groups tending to have more materialist values which are according to, which are um, argued to be driven by memories of scarcity while younger people 
tend to have post-materialist values, which are driven by their experience of relative abundance. And so materialist meaning more concerned with accumulating material things, um, more concerned with having a certain kind of lifestyle, and post-materialist being you know, less concerned about things and more concerned about values, for instance, such as um, environmentalism or sustainability, those types of things. So um, Inglehart claims that the same broad thesis holds true for developed and developing countries. So in the context of material poverty, um, environmental concerns might not be very high on people's list of kind of priorities if they're if they as a as a country are um, concerned with trying to feed their population, trying to you know, work out um, ways of organizing their population to you know, get rid of preventable diseases, for instance, or you know, lower um, like mother and child like infant mortality and um, all of those types of things. It might not be. A, um, a strong priority to be confronting environmental issues if you need to be, for instance, burning wood to cook food. You might not be worried about how much um, CO2 that's putting into the atmosphere at that particular moment in time. Uh, so people in, so Inglehart argues that people in developed countries often make kind of more green choices in their lifestyle and their consumption because they have the, the luxury to make this choice. They're less concerned about the need for material things and more concerned about issues of social identity and lifestyle and um, are able to identify more with post-materialist values because they're not in these conditions of material scarcity and need. And so um, Inglehart has... Uh, has tried to chart this um, generationally in the UK and Western Europe in the 1970s and found that the um, the then kind of post-war generation, which we is our, um, is our baby boomers now, had more kind of post-materialist views than, um, than older age groups. And that post-materialist views kind of grew um, sequentially with each age group. So it's difficult to see whether this is a cohort effect or an age effect just from this particular graph. Um, for instance, it, it may be the case that as you go through the life course, you become more concerned about material things, or it may be that these different um, generational cohorts have had different experiences which have led to different values. In reality, it's probably a little bit of both. It often is. Um, and so some further research has compared um, changes in materialist and post-materialist priorities in five EU countries in, the 19, in 1970 and 2000. And so we can see there's, um, there's kind of a, a growth over time in post-materialist uh, values, especially we can see an interesting growth in the pure post-materialists who are very much committed to those types of values. So that would um, that would support the the hypothesis that the um, the previous graph was showing a, a cohort effect because we know that um, you know, between these times in in the EU, there's a aging population. So it's not necessarily that there's heaps of younger people and it's young people driving this. It is um, potentially more that um, people have held on to these post-materialist values as they've aged and then their children have also developed these values. So that does suggest some support for Inglehart's hypothesis that you know, as people grow up amidst greater material security and greater prosperity, they are less concerned with the kind of day-to-day -day of trying to you know, feed themselves, for instance, and are more able to identify with these post-materialist ideas of you know, trying to consume in a more conscious way, for instance. Um, and then we have Ulrich Beck, who is our, um, our theorist of the risk society. So again, we've um, We've spoken a bit about Beck a few times in this course. Um, his work is very influential in contemporary sociology. So 
Beck um, wrote his book, Risk Society Towards a New Modernity, in, um, in the late 1980s, and his book came out right after the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. Um, and so it was a, a bit, something of a zeitgeist book. It was quite interesting because he had not written about, um, about Chernobyl in his, um, his original version of this book. He had finished the book and then it came out immediately after the, the nuclear accident. And so even though the book wasn't about that, um, about Chernobyl, it still it captured some ideas that were incredibly relevant. So Beck essentially argued that environmental risks have become the, um, the kind of key product of, um, of contemporary industrial societies. They're not just an unpleasant, unpleasant kind of manageable side effect. Um, so he argues that, for instance, um, in the Industrial Revolution, there were factories burning tremendous amounts of coal and um, putting a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere, causing, uh, causing huge amounts of pollution. And um, so we now see when we're charting the kind of CO2 in the atmosphere over time and trying to chart when did things start to kind of go sideways in terms of global warming, we can see that that was a real kind of watershed moment. And that was a very damaging um, development for the environment, if not for manufacturing. And um, so Beck would argue that the, um, the environmental risk that was created in that time was, you know, alongside the creation of um, like, consumer goods and you know, like sheets and pillowcases and dresses and all of those kinds of things there was also the creation of this this environmental risk which is kind of you know we're, we're now aware of and it's come back around to to kind of get us and um this this kind of way that environmental risks come back around and you know, come back to affect us, um, whether there's a pause in time or whether we don't realise the implications of what we're doing at that very moment. Um, Beck refers to that as a as a boomerang effect. Um, the fact that environmental crises, even if we postpone them and ignore them, will still come back around and affect us. We'll still kind of reap what we sow from um, you know, causing environmental damage, whether or not it is intended. And um, Beck argues as well that the the kind of risks caused by environmental damage are that they're risks that can affect both you know rich and poor people. We may differ in our ability to kind of counteract the effect that they have on us personally. We may be kind of differently positioned in our ability to buffer ourselves from them, but we're still affected by them. We can't you know pay to, to live on a different earth. <laughs> and so um, the environmental risks that, that Beck focuses on are, um, are very difficult to handle because they're not really the conventional risks uh, that are you know, small scale, such as chimney pollution. Like we can't really solve um, climate change or uh, you know, address the, the kind of outcomes of nuclear accidents by asking individuals to stop having fires in their homes. Um, the, the risks that Beck focuses on are instead generally risks that have come about as a result of industrialised and energy and material intensive kind of lifestyles and ways of manufacturing in, in many countries around the world. And so in the context of these types of risks, it's very difficult to, to figure out who is responsible. Generally, there's a, a kind of diffused form of responsibility um, in a very abstract sense. The, the countries that are responsible for largest amounts of pollution or largest amounts of CO2 emissions are arguably responsible, but still, you know, those are emissions made by like past kind of members of those societies? Can we hold them to account in the present? Does it work that way? Um, who exactly are we holding to account? How do you hold an entire country to account? 
all of these types of things are, um, are the complexities that are dealt with in Beck's kind of risk society in which we must figure out um, how to cope with these environmental risks that we've created. And um, we found that so far governments have been incredibly reluctant to alter anyone's standard of living and um, to alter their kind of mobility and um, and freedom of choice. Again, we're going back to that statement about not wanting to compromise the American lifestyle. I think we um, we all have, many countries have a, an equivalent of that. So um, yeah, so essentially Beck's Risk Society is talking about, he's proposing that there's a new kind of um, organization of society around managing these large scale risks rather than around um, older identity categories um, such as like class or the family. He as, argues that one's position in relation to risk is a more kind of important um, way of analyzing how they are socially positioned than you know, older ways of doing so. He's got a lot of criticism for that. Um, it's been critiqued for that by by academics who are is still using these um these kind of identity categories that that he does not think are as particularly useful. So um in in Beck's risk society there are unknown and unintended consequences which um come back around to to get us and then drive behavior such as environmental campaigns. Um, we can also see environmental issues moving from the margins of political sen concern to the center. And um, we can see people beginning to recognize that, um, that you know, trying to ensure that they have access to a fair distribution of the kind of wealth in the country or in the world is, is futile if the um, the, the kind of well is poisoned in that sense due to a due to environmental damage and um, yeah essentially um, social concern in um, is quite prominent in societies where kind of wealth and um, and social climbing are considered achievable hence the the notion that the identification of risk depends on the level of social concern in a society which is in turn driven by scarcity and scarcity or abundance um so essentially those who have the most to to lose are generally those that are going to be most kind of concerned about risk so um a kind of final uh a final um idea about or like concept of environmental sociology is the notion of the anthropocene so this is a concept that um that essentially tries to break down the binaries that are between like people, nature, and the physical world, and instead, you know, sees us as an entire system. Um, this concept is trying to kind of reframe the world as, or like reframe, reframe this kind of particular historical era as one in which you know, people nature and the physical world are very much enmeshed and need to be thought of holistically rather than as separate entities. So this concept is trying to push humans beyond thinking about binaries, about completely separate oppositional categories such as human and non-human, subject and object, economy and ecology, thinking and acting. And um, authors such as Donna Haraway are um, a pivotal thinkers on the concept of the, the Anthropocene. So I think Haraway was mentioned in the, um, I think the Digital Sociology Week. So Haraway's work, her kind of system level thinking is, um, is very much relevant here and work on the concept of the Anthropocene. So um, I've put here the, the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change, but I'm not going to cover all of this in detail because I do think that um, that all of you probably have a decent grasp of the kind of mechanisms behind climate change. I think our general um, social awareness of that has has risen a lot. Um, but I will direct you if you're interested. Uh, I'll, I'll pop a link um, with the 
the, the video for this section of the lecture, um, have a look at the Bloomberg Carbon Clock. Essentially, this is a, a, a website that um, documents or using estimates how much CO2 is, um, is in the Earth's atmosphere at this given point in time and kind of comes along with some interesting figures and facts. So I, I find it quite interesting for, um, for kind of getting your head around what is happening in terms of climate change and where we're kind of at with it at present. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to skip over the kind of global warming climate change and the greenhouse effect. Um, do have a look at these slides if it's something you're interested in, um, but I'm sure you have a very good understanding already of what this means and the the potential consequences of um, of climate change. I think we all unfortunately have have a very sober idea of what that means. Um, and so I'll bring us here to to think a bit about the ideas of a kind of ecological footprint. So these are ways of trying to understand um, the the kind of well, I would say the the footprint or the the, the kind of uh, balance sheet of um, supply and demand in an ecological sense for a given location. So uh, you would have a, a kind of neutral footprint if your demand and supply were, were even. So if your demand for um, the kind of ecological assets that your population requires um, balances with the, the kind of productivity of your ecological assets. So the idea of kind of balancing supply and demand in terms of use of ecological materials is um, is similar to the idea of offsetting. So the notion that if you want to take a, a flight, you need to plant this many trees. Um, there's a similar kind of principle at play here, and um, this is what this is kind of a diagram of um, what an ecological footprint can look like. So you'd have um, you know some some kind of cars, you also have grazing land, so there's um, you know, forest to be absorbing some of the CO2 from the atmosphere, um, some sections of built up land, but also some unbuilt up sections. And so there's a sense of kind of trying to, um, to balance uh, bio capacity. And then another model of the ecological footprint can be expressed um, rather than looking at uh, specific locations you can look at um, kind of global hectares and you can compare um, different locations on this basis rather than looking at kind of you know towns or places where people are living so um, the the argument is that if a population's ecological footprint exceeds the region's um, bio capacity then the region's running an ecological deficit, and this is demand exceeding supply. And then if its biocapacity exceeds its ecological footprint, it, um, it has an ecological reserve. So the idea of the ecological footprint is essentially just a, an idea of how, how we can live sustainably, how we can live in a way that is in better balance with with the natural world um, or how we can live in better balance with the, the world that we're already part of in a more kind of anthropocentric or you know, anthropocene kind of view. Um, and apparently Australia currently has an ecological reserve, but over 80% of the world's population lives in countries that are running ecological deficits. And are therefore using more resources than their ecosystems can renew. So places such as the US, India, China. So um, I don't think that you would need to have tremendously sophisticated maths to know that if 80% of the population is, are in countries where there's um, ecological deficits, we're probably as, as a planet running quite a bad deficit. And that's um, what's getting us into the, the trouble that we're in. So Again, this is a, a kind of model for thinking through what a more balanced approach might look like. So um, finally, some some things that can be done. Um, some recommendations that have been made include um, cutting fossil fuels in transport, using different times of transport, um, 
electric cars are an example, cutting domestic energy use and heating and cooling, uh, reducing production of consumer goods, so consuming less. Um, this goes to the idea of a kind of uh, like post-materialist um, way of relating to consumption. Uh, there's also the possibility of recycling and reusing products to save energy and production and raw materials, um, preserving forests, planting more trees, moving to renewable energy sources, which um, it would be really nice if we could do that here in Australia at a bit of a, a sharper pace. I would really appreciate that. And um, finally, using energy supplies efficiently in production, transport and buildings. So again, being conscious of how energy is used and you know, seeking to ensure that we're not using far more energy than is sustainable. And so again, bringing the, um, the sociological the environmental sociology, that perspective back into things, um, the extent to which these matters are taken up and by whom is um, is really a, so a social and cultural issue that can be explored by sociological research. And so sociological research has a really interesting role in, um, in essentially figuring out why are some of these options more or less appealing than others? What would need to happen for these things to be taken up? Who is taking up these options and who is not? Um, why is there really strong social support for some solutions and not others? All of these are sociological questions and they are the kind of core business of many, many environmental sociologists. So just before I finish up, I wanted to spruik, um the second year course that we have here at Newcastle, uh, Soccer 2065, Environment and Society. If you're interested in any of the material that we've, um, we've covered today, this might be you know, a course that you would really enjoy. It's taken by Jai Cooper, who some of you have been really, really lucky to have as your tutor. Um, Jai is an amazing environmental sociologist. And yeah, I really strongly recommend the course. It's absolutely fantastic and it uses lots of kind of local examples from Newcastle which I find so interesting um looking through some of the material and talking to Jai helped me to understand the kind of my own local environment in some different ways so yeah that's something to to think about if you're a budding environmental sociologist or just want to learn a bit more about it so finally, um, some kind of summary points uh, so we can remember that our conceptualizations of, um, of nature and the environment are generally kind of you know, loaded with um, our, our kind of social and cultural perspective on what is constituted by these terms. And we can consider why and how sociologists study the environment and society and how environment and society fit together. Um, then think back to the new ecological paradigm and the increasing support in some ways for um, for kind of more ecocentric um, rather than anthropocentric views. Uh, we can also think back to um, social constructivist and realist perspectives on the environment, the environment and risk society, how the um the the environmental risks that we we face in many ways are a a direct result of our own behavior and even our kind of past um successes or the developments that have led to our current standard of living um and the sociological researchers and the environment um hopefully gave you a sense of some of the areas in which um sociological workers and theorists are addressing issues relevant to the environment, working on environmentalism or trying to understand environmental problems and how we relate to them socially. And then finally, we have our ideas about global warming and climate change and the ecological footprint as a model for, um, for how we might be trying to, to kind of balance accounts in our you know, supply and demand of um, of environmental and kind of ecological capacity. So hopefully you've um, 
you've come across something new and interesting in this lecture and uh, since this is the final one for the semester I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank you so much for your um your kind of attention and engagement this semester I know it's not necessarily easy having the lectures online it's been quite odd for me personally to um to sit in my spare room and record the lectures rather than delivering them in person it's definitely a bit more difficult to see how things are landing and whether I need to explain something a bit further so um I, I really appreciate you bearing with us this semester um as we go through our kind of COVID <laughs> way of teaching and yeah I, I really really hope that you've enjoyed the course uh all of us have really enjoyed teaching it I love teaching this course it's fantastic to be able to tell people about sociology and social science in many cases for the first time um and good luck with the rest of your your degrees um have a fantastic kind of rest of this semester. Good luck with all of your final assignments.